Hello everybody, today we're going to look at Henry VII and in particular this key question, how did relations with foreign powers change and how was the success and secured? So this is the third of the key questions for, for our A-level AQA unit uh, 1C. Now Henry VII is a very, very able politician and there's some really clever stuff in what he does with foreign relations, but we need to be uh, mindful at this point in time, England is not a great power. There's several kind of major forces in Europe. Uh, there's uh, the long established main power of France. Uh, there's the Holy Roman Empire. And there's this emerging power, which is Spain. So England really is a kind of a second rate nation in terms of um, power in Europe. And Henry VII does a reasonably good job. And we're going to look at how good a job he does with the different nations as we go through. Now, he's trying to um, achieve several things in his foreign policy. He, he's looking to secure his own crown. So we have lots of dealings uh, with, um, with the uh, support for the pretenders. He's trying to look at succession. So he's trying to get suitable uh, marriages that are going to get him recognised as a, a, a true monarch. And, and just even interactions and recognition from foreign powers is going to really build that um, for Henry now, the other bit that he's looking for is a bit we can look at first, which is money. So as we, we looked at when we looked at power of the monarchy and government, start of Henry's reign, Henry is broke. England is broke. It's been fighting this rather ruinous uh, war of the roses. So one of the ways to access more money is through trade. And there's a whole series of different uh, trade agreements that Henry makes. And these help build up uh, the English economy. So, for example, if we start off looking at some trade agreements right at the beginning of his reign, one of the most important is the Navigation Act. Uh, and essentially, this stopped English merchants using foreign ships um, unless there was no English ships there at all. And then every, and every single English ship had to have at least half its men as Englishmen. So he really is trying to build kind of that mercantile trade bit into Britain and that the English merchants use English boats and English sailors. For their trade and that can generate more money in the economy. There's commerce treaty with France removing um, a restriction on English French trade which again is beneficial both to England and France and there's a commercial treaty uh, with Brittany and the stuff with France and Brittany we're going to look at in more detail later on is quite intertwined. Um, there's a long history with Henry and, and Brittany. He the, the, the Duke of Brittany, Duke Francis II, had uh, given him shelter whilst he was in exile from 1471 to 1484 and, and supported him in, in going uh, for the English throne. So it is a nation uh, 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 that he uh, has a, a great affinity with and owes a great debt, and that's going to cause him some problems with his foreign policy. Um, another uh, emerging power, Portugal, is a, a, there's a commercial alliance with them. Again, it gives a, a further trade option uh, for the English a treaty with Florence that allows English wool to be imported into uh, Pisa, which was the main uh, main port of Florence. Again, so this is all developing trade. This is all bringing wealth into the country. And increasingly, this is a changing part of the Tudor economy with the wool industry and the wool trade becoming a really, really significant. Um, in 1492, he imposed tariffs on Venetian wine, uh, which then uh, forced the Venetian government into uh, lifting uh, import duties on English goods, in particular English wool again. If we go to 1496, uh, we see uh, Intercursus Magnus, which is a free trade deal with Burgundy, uh, apart from Flanders. And this becomes uh, a really major part, uh, and, and this woolen cloth uh, production in England is a major, major growth. Uh, and the Intercursus Magnus has other other key bits in it. Uh, it, it comes about actually because um, the uh, there was this kind of improving uh, relations uh, with Burgundy, uh, which was needed after some uh, earlier action. Um, and, and we see the, this idea that the it's linked with the Pretenders and Warbeck. So in terms of relations, foreign relations in trade, then I would say Henry VII does a good job uh, and he generates a lot for England and we see this growing importance of the English wool trade. Right. Another one where it all seems to go um, wonderfully well is with Scotland. In 1493, we see a nine year truce um, between England and Scotland. Uh, and, and this is 
this is important. Again, it's the only country with a land border with England uh, and it's got this old alliance with France. And so kind of keeping Scotland on side makes England's borders secure. And this is going to help with uh, key policy aims of Henry. Things take a turn for the worse, though, when um, the Scots start supporting um, Warbeck, one of the pretenders. And so there's this crisis point uh, with Scotland. But Henry, Henry proves himself to be the, the kind of the master negotiator after there's a small incursion into uh, England by Scottish troops backing uh, Warbeck's claim. Um, and what we see is the Truce of Aiton. And, and essentially, in exchange um, for uh, the promise of the hand of marriage of um, Margaret, um, one of uh, Henry's daughters, um, James turns his back on uh, on Warbeck, and we see this kind of full peace treaty. And it's the first time this has happened between England and Scotland since 15, uh, since 1328. And then it is consolidated, uh, first of all, with the most beautiful sounding treaty ever, the Treaty of Perpetual Peace, which is a wonderful, wonderful sentiment. Um, and then we see the marriage of James and Margaret in 1503, and that extends the truce. So, again, in terms of relations with Scotland, then we can really can see a great deal of success from Henry. There's this awkward moment when James is supporting Walbeck, but all that is overcome. And Henry is really successful here in his relationship with Scotland. And we also here are seeing a royal marriage, which helps in terms of raising the position of the Tudor house uh, in terms of recognition through um, Europe, because we have a, a royal marriage. So, you know, we'll then see people denying um, the, the uh, regalness, the, royal, the royalty of the Tudors. Right, <clears throat> with Spain, in, in this thing start really, really well. Spain is a really important and emerging power. It's been unified under Isabel and Ferdinand. Um, because it was previously it's got two major uh, kingdoms, Castile and Aragon, um, and they um, have been united under these two. Now, the, the Treaty of Medina del Campo, they, they recognise Henry VII as king, again, it's quite early in his reign, it's a really significant uh, moment, There's a, a, it helps with trade, it ends trade restrictions. And then we also see this really important promised marriage of Catherine of Aragon to Henry's uh, first son and heir, Prince Arthur. And there's some agreement in this. Uh, so um, Spain's emerging power, its main com competition for power in Europe is a France. And they, um, they, they're saying, right, they, this, you've got some bits of land that you want off the French. We've got some bits of land we like off the French. Let's combine on this. And they, they, they talk about recovering uh, Normandy and Aquitaine. And in 1501, um, there is the marriage of uh, Arthur and Catherine. Unfortunately, it's a very short one, as, as in on April uh, the second Arthur dies. And this is the bit where where things um, start to get complicated. And it's a really kind of sad period in uh, Henry's uh, life here. His, his eldest son dies in 1501. His much loved queen dies in 1503. Uh, and at that point they propose, well, what, maybe what we should do is, is um, we'll keep Catherine here uh, and uh, we'll uh, marry her to Henry when he's old enough. Uh, Things then get even more complicated. Um, Isabel uh, of Spain, Isabel uh, uh, of Castile, dies, and, and we're going to see now this competition for the, the throne of Castile. And things get difficult now um, with Spain uh, and, and, we, and for the whole of Europe, really. 1505, we see the Treaty of Blois between Aragon and France, uh, and Ferdinand, having lost his uh, wife Isabella, now marries uh, Louis' niece. Germain de Foix, uh, and the, the French help Aragon uh, Philip, um, fight for Ferdinand of Aragon against Philip of Castile. Um, and so we're, we're starting to see a shift of power in Europe. Um, the, the League of Cambrai uh, in 1508 um, sees, sees Louis of France and uh, Spain uh, the, uh, as the main players uh, with England kind of isolated at this point, though this can be seen as a positive. Henry VII is getting a bit older and actually he doesn't really want to be centre of all the intrigue in Europe. This is one of the things that really separates him from his son, Henry VIII. He doesn't really want to be all involved in it. He wants to be recognised as king and he wants to kind of stay out of it and not 
not get dragged into a war. Wars are expensive. Henry VII doesn't like spending money. And then in 1509, Henry dies and Henry VIII becomes king. And very shortly afterwards, he does marry Catherine. And so we see that kind of there's a really, really good start relationship with Spain. And there's a very, very solid end. And there's a bit of confusion and difficulty in the middle where Henry VII has to play quite difficult. He, he potentially becomes a competitor uh, with Ferdinand in the marriage market in in Europe amongst the royalty as they both lose their first wives. But what we, we, we really see here is relative success in relationship with an increasingly powerful nation. Right, this is the bit that gets really complicated. So as I mentioned earlier, Henry had a, this kind of long term relationship with um, with Brittany, but France is this major, major power. So Brittany is under major threat from France. And the Treaty of Redon in 1489 has, sees Brittany and England kind of um, on the same side. They, there's 6000 troops that are sent to help defend Breton independence from the um, from the French, the Duchess of Brittany and uh, has to pay for the troops. Uh, and, and there's this idea that she won't make any alliances without Henry's approval. Um, the, we get the Treaty of uh, Dordrecht in uh, 14, 1489. Uh, and again, in this, Henry is sending troops and they're going to help uh, Maximilian, who's the Holy Roman Emperor, fight against um, the French. But Maximilian kind of goes back on his part of the bargain. And Hand is then forced, and she ends up marrying Charles VIII, um, and France takes Brittany, which he then keeps um, control of. So Henry has this kind of debt he feels to to, to Brittany, and also um, Brittany is it, it faces the English coast, uh, and and an increasingly powerful France is not a particular particularly the neighbour that the English want. So Henry then takes an unusually bold move and he, he sends 12,000 troops to Brittany to try and, and again see off the French. Now, whether he truly intended to see off the French, as we can see, there's been the marriage the year before and, and Brittany's fate seems rather sealed, it is maybe slightly debatable. But what he what it does do is it, it leads to uh, the Treaty of Etape. And with that, all English troops go from France, apart from Calais, which the English uh, hold. And England is then paid, or Henry is paid by France, this enormous amount of money of um, 745,000 crowns, 159,000 pounds. And, and they also withdraw the support that they were starting to show for Warbeck. Warbeck had been at, at the French court and had been promised um, support. And so that goes. So, whether Henry's objective here really is to do with Brittany or whether it is to do with Warbeck, and there's a nice sweetener of a large chunk of money, which Henry VII is always um, rather keen to get. We see some further interactions with the French going forward. There's the Holy League um, or, or the League of Venice, which is set up to oppose the French during the Italian Wars. And England's kind of pressured in, into becoming entangled in that. But again, Henry VII isn't really keen on that very much. Um, and the danger of that kind of stuff is shown uh, 10 years later with the Treaty of Bois in 1505, where we, we see this marriage we've already mentioned between um, Ferdinand uh, and Germain de Foix. Uh, uh, and so we've got this kind of big power block potentially uh, it, it, with Spain and France united. And, and against that kind of force, England really is small fry and would get into a lot of difficulty. Uh, and we see, again, the League of Cambrai 1508, which the French are, are, are involved in. The French and the Spanish are the main players. Uh, England um, is kind of isolated for, from European affairs. But again, as I said before on this one, it kind of suits Henry. So it's difficult to judge, really, in terms of, of uh, relations with France. It starts really, really badly um, with, with Henry siding with Brittany. The Treaty of Etape arguably is, is a great, great success. I mean, he, he kind of does sell Brittany a bit down the river, but it, he gets major things that he wants. He's recognised by the French throne. He, they stop supporting uh, Warbeck. He gets a large chunk of money. The bits after that, it's a bit mixed, but there's nothing really definitive. So if I was to look at it overall, I think it starts badly. I think the Treaty of Etape is a major success for Henry VII. Right, Burgundy and the Holy Roman Empire. I'm going to deal with these two together because they are kind of 
entwined. Maximilian is the Holy Roman Emperor. He married Mary, who was the daughter of Charles the Bold and the stepdaughter of Margaret of Burgundy. So Charles the Bold of Burgundy, uh, who, who dies leaving behind um, his, his new wife, Margaret, and her stepdaughter, his daughter, um, Mary. He, Mary then dies herself in 1482, and she leaves behind um, her four-year-old son, Philip. Control of um, the Holy Roman Empire and the uh, and Burgundy are quite complicated, a bit above and beyond what we need to do. Margaret is a real problem, and things start really badly for Henry. Uh, Margaret is um, a Yorkist by blood and has a distant claim to the English throne. And she backs anybody against Henry. Essentially, she sends 2,000 mercenaries to aid Simnel against him in 1487. Now, this is kind of then countered after that. Henry makes a, a treaty with the Holy, Holy Roman Empire, uh, and, and it kind of takes away that threat that they're going to back somebody and invade England at that point. Uh, again, we've got the, um, the Treaty of Dordrecht, which I've already mentioned. Um, so it looks like relationships are getting better, but Maximilian doesn't meet his side of the bargain, so maybe they aren't all that good. Um, Maximilian makes peace with Charles of France. So again, the, this concept, this kind of grouping in Europe, these much more powerful players in England, is a bit of a worry um, for Henry. Again, there's an, another unusually bold move by, move by Henry in 1493 when he imposes a trade embargo on Burgundy, um, who had been supporting Warbeck, and it, it actually it, it actually works. Uh, in 1496, we see Intercutus Magnus, which again is, the, is this free trade deal, and this again seems to suggest a real thawing of uh, relations and improvement relations with Burgundy, and this really helps um, the um, the English. Uh, the English cloth trade, and it also, as Philip is is getting older, is it, we've we've now got this idea that Philip it, that Burgundy is not going to support uh, Warbeck in the way that uh, Margaret had had been doing earlier, and the way that she supported Simnel earlier. It's a real turn of luck for Henry in 1506. Philip of Burgundy is shipwrecked in England. Um, we get the intercursor's malice. So Burgundy say they'll give back the Earl of Suffolk. Um, <laughs> they don't then give him back. Henry has to pay for him, but again, uh, he, he gets what he wants really out of it. Uh, there are various marriage proposals that are never actually come through. There's an idea that you're having a Burgundian bride for Henry VIII, but that doesn't actually happen. And we we see a a, a fairly a fairly decent treaty. It was a bit too generous for for England, and so it's reverted in 1507 after um, Philip dies in 15 uh, later in 1506. Right. So in terms of succession, um, it's quite a, a complicated uh, picture. So I've, I've got to try to go through this kind of date by date. So Henry does. Henry and Elizabeth do the key bit that they need to do for succession is they, they have a son in, in 1486, which is Arthur. Um, just three years uh, later, we see the promise of the marriage between Arthur and Catherine. Uh, and obviously Arthur's a very young lad at this time, as, he, uh, as is Catherine, very young lady, not a very young lad. Um, we then see the, uh, the birth of Margaret Tudor, who's going to be a, a really significant figure in terms of the future of royalty in England uh, and, uh, and across um, the, the whole of Britain. Uh, Henry, the, the Henry is born, Hen, who's going to become Henry VIII in 1491, and then there's another daughter, Mary, born in 1496, and there are there were actually other children as well. Not all of them uh, survived into adulthood. 1501, Catherine arrives in England. Arthur and Catherine then get married. So we we've got this really kind of important um, step for this in terms of the succession, because we've got a royal marriage. This looks like you're going to have a long-term um, kind of agreement with with Spain, a kind of marriage alliance. Unfortunately, Arthur dies in 1502, and th this kind of throws the whole thing in the air. But the Henry VII has done what you need to do as king. He not only has an heir in Arthur, he has a spare in Henry. Uh, and so we've got this idea that Henry will uh, marry Catherine. In, in the same year that that promise is made, 1503, 
uh, Margaret marries James uh, the fourth of Scotland and here we see the Stuart line because um, Margaret and James will have a son called James who will become James the fifth. James uh, the fifth has a daughter called Mary who will become Mary Queen of Scots and um, Mary has a daughter Mary has a son who will become James the sixth of Scotland and James the first of England. So Margaret's line goes through lasts longer than um, the the line of Henry uh, the eighth in terms of going through in terms of the English throne. So it's a really important part of it. Uh, but again, it's also really significant is we've got that other international marriage. So we've had the children of Henry the seventh who we remember had this really poor blood claim now marrying into the royal family of Spain and the royal family of Scotland. And this is then finalised in 1509 when Henry VIII marries Catherine. Right, thank you very much for watching, got through lots in that. Uh, don't forget to like, to subscribe, uh, to comment, and we'll continue working through the Tudors and looking at these key questions in future videos. Thank you again for watching. I'll speak to you all again soon.